an MS PhD in applied physics from the California Institute of Technology. He served on the technical staffs of San Diego National Lab and Lawrence Livermore National Lab and spectral technology before joining the University of Illinois in 1986, where he was the founder professor of engineering and served in several administrative roles. In January of 2005, Dr. Koshner joined Iowa State University as Dean of Engineering, where he established the Engineering Policy and Leadership Institute. Professor Koshner joined the University of Michigan as founding director of the Michigan Institute of Plasma Science and Engineering, and George Haddad, professor in September of 2008. <laughs> professor Koshner's research area in the fundamentals and application of low temperature plasmas and which he has extensively published. His research group has developed several suites for computer models of low temperature plasmas, plasma chemistry, and plasma surface interaction, which are widely used in university and industry. Professor Kushner is a fellow of several societies and has received several awards, including the APS Alice Prize. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering uh, and most recently co-chaired the National Academy's Decadal Study on Plasma Science. So please join me and welcome our speaker, Dr. Mark Kushner. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to give uh, today's seminar. Uh, the title of the seminar, as Professor Samani mentioned, is Integrated Reactor and Feature Scale Modeling for Plasma-Based Microelectronics Fabrication. Uh, this work has been supported over many years by LAM Research Corporation, Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, Samsung, and Tokyo Electron. I'd like to begin by acknowledging many, many collaborators and students, uh, former students who have done the work that I will speak about today. I merely take credit for what they do. So in today's talk, I'd like to begin with a bit of an introduction to low temperature plasmas and try to make the case that the semiconductor industry is actually based on plasma physics. And I'll go through um, some modeling activities that we've done over the years and how we're trying to apply fundamental modeling to the improvement of semiconductor manufacturing. So let's begin with the basics. Plasmas, ionized gases. Plasmas are ionized gases that are composed of neutral atoms, molecules, positive and negative ions, and electrons. For example, dry air plasma may have nitrogen and oxygen as neutrals, and nitrogen ions positive, uh, oxygen ions positive, negative, and electrons that charge particles. A plasma on the average is electrically neutral. You have as many positive charges as negative charges. And what you see here is what's known as a plasma jet. It is an atmospheric pressure plasma sustained in a plume of a rare gas, which is uh, exhausted into the ambient. I like to think of plasmas as a power transfer media. You take power out of the wall plug, you condition it to create electric fields. Those electric fields accelerate charged particles like electrons that physically collide with atoms and molecules breaking apart those molecules to create radicals, ionize the, the molecules to create ions. If an electron excites a xenon atom, for example, creates an excited state, and that excited state radiates to emit a photon, we call that a lamp. And in fact, the projector lamp that we're using today is based exactly on this process. You have an electron that dissociates a methane molecule to, to create some methyl radicals. Those methyl radicals diffuse to a surface and coat, uh, creating a diamond-like carbon film. All of your eyeglasses that have scratch-resistant coatings are formed in this fashion. And this ability to create reactive species that interact with surfaces have led to a tremendous variety of 
of society benefiting technologies from lighting, thrusters, new area of healthcare, displays, and what we'll talk about today, microelectronics processing. So before we begin that, I'd like to condense a four semester sequence that I teach in plasma physics into three minutes. A three minute primer on low temperature plasmas. So ionized gases, low temperature plasmas, positive ions, negative ions, and electrons that on the average are electrically neutral. What distinguishes our particular type of plasmas is that the fraction of the electrically charged species compared to the neutral species is very small. You put a gas inside some sort of vessel, you apply a voltage between a positive terminal and a negative terminal, that creates an electric field. That electric field then accelerates electrons. Those electrons gain energy, collide with a molecule, knocking off an electron that's called an ionization and creating another ion. That is a cascading process. An electron collides with an oxygen molecule, for example, may dissociate that oxygen molecule to create radicals, uh, will ionize a species that then creates a second electron, and that a second electron can ionize and dissociate. In that process of electron scattering off of molecules, you create radicals. You dissociate an oxygen molecule, you create oxygen radicals, dissociate a water molecule, you create hydroxyl radicals. That is plasma-initiated chemistry. Reactions between those radicals is then plasma chemistry. And by controlling the rate at which these radicals are produced, by controlling the electron impact processes, you can produce any variety of reactive environments. For example, this is an example of the very large number of different types of positive ions that can be made by a very short plasma pulse in just humid air. The interaction between these species is plasma chemistry, and that's what we try to control in semiconductor fabrication. So you now have credit for a four semester class in plasma physics. Semiconductor manufacturing is indeed a plasma-enabled industry. Uh, you may be familiar with this concept of Moore's Law. Moore's Law is an expression that the number of functioning devices on a semiconductor chip increases or doubles every 18 months. Today, with tens of billions of transistors on them, and the way that those devices, you get more devices is to make them smaller. The feature size in 1980, uh, 1985, when the Intel 3D6 transistor came out or processor came out was about 1.25 microns. The A15 microprocessor that is in iPhones today has feature sizes that are about 10 nanometers. That's only 100 angstroms. That ability to fabricate these very, very, very small devices is entirely a result of controlling plasma processes that interact with semiconductor wafers. The industry makes chips. The chips are made in plasma reactors. The plasma reactors depend upon plasma physics to deliver reactive species to the wafer to etch and deposit materials. So how does this work? Well, at a very high level, plasma etching works by flowing a non-reactive gas like argon chlorine into a chamber. You sustain a plasma, which is a glowing gas that's seen up here in the left, top left corner. Electrons physically collide with the chlorine molecule, molecule to create chlorine atoms. Those chlorine atoms then diffuse to a surface like silicon. They adsorb on the silicon surface. 
An ion comes along, strikes that adsorbed site, knocks off a silicon atom as an etch product, and you pump the etch product away. Now, there are a huge variety of different types of plasmas that can be uh, used for these processes. This is what's known as a capacitively coupled plasma, where you apply a voltage to the substrate upon which the wafer sits. You apply a radio frequency voltage to another electrode. One voltage heats the plasma. A second voltage accelerates ions into the substrate to strike the wafer. There are different types of materials that are uh, etched in semiconductor fabrication. One class of materials is generically called conductors. That would be silicon. And the process is having chlorine atoms, for example, successively come down to passivate a silicon atom by breaking bonds of that silicon with other silicons and replacing those bonds with chlorine atoms. Every time you break one of these bonds, you decrease the binding energy of that silicon into the lattice. So you make it easier for an ion to remove that passivated silicon atom compared to the silicon atoms that are not passivated. So there's a tremendous amount of effort that is expended in the industry to craft the distribution of ion energies in angular distributions so that you can activate one process, such as chemical sputtering, but not activate another process, such as physical sputtering. That leads to selectivity, being able to remove one material and leaving behind another material. The fact that the ions are coming down vertically onto the wafer with a very narrow angular spread then leads to anisotropy. Anisotropy is the ability to etch a feature deeply with very straight walls. Plasma chemistry allows those, that etch process to stop when you reach a material that you don't want to etch. That's called selectivity. So anisotropy and selectivity are the basis of fabricating the features that make microprocessors. So what are some of the challenges in applying plasmas to manufacture these very small features? A very big challenge is what's called RD, aspect ratio dependent etching. Uh, this is a 16 nanometer thin FET structure manufactured by Tokyo, excuse me, by Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC. And what you notice in this structure is that there are different aspect ratios. An aspect ratio is the ratio of the height divided by the width of the structure. The rate of etching, uh, etching these features is proportional to the aspect ratio, or inversely proportional to the aspect ratio. So etching all these features at the same rate when you have R day is very challenging. Another challenging is, challenge is, is selectivity. Selectivity is etching one material, but not etching another material. And this is a, a big challenge in what's known as self-aligned contacts, where you would like to remove silicon dioxide between two silicon nitride features, but not remove the silicon nitride. A third feature is high aspect ratio etching. The high capacity memory that you have in thumb drives, 256 gigabytes in a little thumb drive, results from the three-dimensional memory components that are shown here. Part of that manufacturing process is to etch a high aspect ratio very, very uh, deep via through multiple layers of material. The aspect ratio of these structures is greater than the Empire State Building. And that is a state-of-the-art challenge. So we do modeling. We develop computer models that represent these processes. And there are many, many challenges in doing that. There are many different types of reactors. There's a very large range in pressures. There are many, many different chemistries. <clears throat> 
perhaps the greatest challenge in chemistry and reaction mechanisms is developing the uh, chemistry and reaction mechanisms. So there are many examples of companies doing this type of modeling to uh, some degree of success. Here's an example of modeling done by LAM Research Corporation, which is one of the major equipment suppliers, in which the problem is to etch what's known as a fin in silicon without etching the bottom of the feature. This is called the silicon recess problem. They have applied fundamental modeling to produce the reactive species in the gas phase that are incident down onto the wafer, use those reactive species in feature scale models to predict the implantation of reactive species into the silicon, minimize that implantation that then minimizes the recess. Uh, this is an example of modeling performed by Tokyo Electron, another equipment manufacturer in which they have used models to, uh, to simulate multi-frequency excitation, many frequencies applied to a low pressure plasma to produce radical and ion fluxes down onto a wafer, and then use feature scale modeling to predict the evolution of a feature and the uh, eventual closing of that feature by depositing polymer on the opening. So these are the sorts of things that are being done in real time in industry using modeling. So in our group, we do similar things. We have developed over the years several modeling platforms to address both the reactor scale and the feature scale. A modern semiconductor wafer is 30 centimeters in diameter. So the plasma reactors that address, that house those those uh, wafers are about a meter in size. Modern micro devices have, di have dimensions of tens of nanometers. So this is truly a multi-scale problem. What we try to do is include as much fundamental physics as possible. We solve equations that you're probably familiar with, Maxwell's equations, Navier-Stokes equations, Boltzmann's equations, from the very, very basic perspective and then build up from those equations to create what can be thought of as a computer-aided design tool. Those reactive species are used as input to feature scale simulators. The feature scale simulators use kinetic Monte Carlo techniques to represent a feature in a semiconductor device on a voxel by voxel basis each one of those voxels has a material identity, and we add and remove material according to the probability that there be an etch, a deposition, or a change in chemical composition. To do that, you need to worry about many fundamental processes. One of them is implantation. When an energetic particle strikes the surface, it may implant itself by digging a little tunnel into the surface, uh, penetrating many tens of nanometers. And all that needs to be accounted for in the models. All models need to be validated. A validated and unvalidated model is perhaps not particularly valuable. And here is an example of validation of some of our models at LAM Research Corporation showing the evolution of silicon features etched in a helium chlorine plasma when you vary the spacing between features and put features at the end of a line or in the middle of a line. And the agreement that can be obtained is actually pretty good. So I'd like to start the discussion of the actual modeling of these processes by saying just a few words about this aspect dependent ratio etching, which is fundamental to all plasma processes. So imagine that you have a very deep circular feature, we call that a via, and you are a neutral molecule that comes into the feature and you reflect off the sidewall. 
there is equal probability that you will scatter up as well as down. So the deeper the feature, the more difficult it is for species to rattle around to the bottom of the feature where the etching is actually occurring. This is one of the fundamental aspects of, of aspect ratio dependent etching, that the deeper a feature becomes, the more difficult it is to transfer reactants to the bottom of the feature. And when you incorporate those processes into models, the reproducing this aspect ratio dependent etching just naturally comes out as a consequence of the physics. You etch wider features more rapidly than narrower features because a molecule is able to rattle to the bottom of the wider feature faster. So that has many, many implications in plasma etching. This is the simulation of what's called a thin uh, that is used in modern microprocessor uh, design where the etching of the thin in the middle is slower than the edges. And that's because molecules coming to the middle have to go through a very narrow channel, whereas molecules that come in from the sides have what looks like a lower aspect ratio. And this is something that is a prevalent problem in microelectronics fabrication. So let's look at a state-of-the-art problem in semiconductor design. Uh, multi-frequency, high aspect ratio etching. So this is what a modern plasma etching reactor looks like. It's cylindrically symmetric, so you're looking at only half of the reactor. You put the wafer here. You apply multiple radio frequencies, power supplies to the bottom to accelerate ions into the wafer. You apply yet another frequency on the top in order to sustain the plasma. These systems operate at very low pressure, 25 millitor, 760 tor to an atmosphere. So this is about 1 50,000th of an atmosphere. The gas mixture can be quite complicated, a mixture of argon, C4F8, and oxygen. 80 megahertz on the top and two frequencies on the bottom, 10 and 5 megahertz. The amount of power you put into these systems is very large. Uh, something more, something approaching 10 kilowatts of power is applied to the wafer. The reaction mechanism that's used it tries to include all the appropriate species, excited states of argon, and all the fragments of dissociating the C4F8. The system that we're interested in is etching of silicon dioxide, a dielectric. And the way that occurs is that you deposit a very thin layer, only a few nanometers thick, of a fluorocarbon polymer that looks a little bit like Teflon. That fluorocarbon polymer interacts with the silicon dioxide to create a complex of silicon, carbon, and fluorine. Ions then penetrate through this thin polymer layer to activate an etch at the interface and the etch products diffuse back through that polymer layer and get pumped out. So here are predictions of the charged species in one of these reactors. This is the electron density, a positive ion density, negative ion density. The wafer sits here on the, way, on the substrate. The plasma densities that you produce are about 10 to the 11th per cubic centimeter that's a fractional ionization of, uh, of about 10 to the minus 3. A voltage of a few thousand volts accelerate ions from the plasma to intersect the wafer. You produce fluxes of radicals, neutral, and ions that strike the wafer from the center to the edge. And those ions have a particular ion energy distribution. What you see at the left is the energy of individual ions like oxygen, argon, CF, 
C2F4+, all of which have a unique energy distribution. Those ions also have an angular spread. Ideally, you'd like them to come down with zero angle onto the wafer to be an anisotropic etch, but there's some angular breadth to that distribution. You put those fluxes into the feature scale model and you predict the following. This is a high aspect ratio feature being etched in silicon dioxide. Uh, the pink at the top is a photoresist mask, which gets etched a little bit. The red and green that you see on the inside of the feature being etched is the passivation of the sidewalls by this fluorocarbon film. At the end of the day, you are able to etch an aspect ratio of 40 with fairly straight walls, which is a good thing. How you etch that feature is in large part a function of how species interact with the sidewalls. If you have an aspect ratio greater than 7 or 8, you are absolutely guaranteed that species will scatter off the sidewalls before they get to the bottom of the feature. The angular distribution is not just zero angle, but has a breadth of angles. So the ability to etch these very high aspect ratio features is in large part predicated by controlling how ions will scatter off of sidewalls and continue down in deeper into the feature. In fact, if you look at the neutral flux that comes into the feature as a function of depth, you get very little neutral flux that is able to rattle its way down to the bottom of the feature. That's the R day, aspect dependent etching aspect. Most of the neutrals that come to the bottom of the feature originated by ions that hit the sidewall and continued as a neutral. So how do you control it? Well, one easy way is simply to turn the power up. So as you increase the power from 2.5 kilowatts to 10 kilowatts, you produce more energetic ions that have a narrower angular distribution. And that gives you some ability to define not only the etch rate, but the sidewall slope. For those people who know a little bit about uh, circuits, capacitance is in large part a surface to volume ratio. If you are backfilling these features with a dielectric to make capacitors, the shape of the feature determines its capacitance because then that determines the surface to volume ratio. Now, a, an unsaid aspect of semiconductor manufacturing today, well, so far in this talk, is the fact that, that you have charged species that are striking the wafer, and the wafer is a dielectric. Semiconductor people like to think of silicon as a, as a conductor. It's not, it's a dielectric. And dielectrics charge up. One of the challenges in semiconductor processing is that because the ions are anisotropic, they strike the inside of the feature, they deposit their charge on the inside of the feature, and that leads to positive charging inside features. And that positive charging then affects the next positive ion that comes into the feature. That tends to be a very stochastic process, meaning a random process. These features are getting so small that the ions that come into the feature are statistical. You don't get exactly the same ions into each one of the features. And that leads to statistical variation in the charging of the feature that leads to what's known as twisting and pattern-dependent distortion. So what is pattern-dependent distortion? Your memory device is composed of a billion holes that are drilled into the semiconductor, each one of which has many, many bits of memory. 
those holes are laid out in some pattern. They can be densely packed or they can be less densely packed. The closer these features are together, the more the charging inside the features interact with each other. And that leads to uh, distortions such as the direction in which the, uh, the via is etched is not directly vertical, but de deviates off to one side. That's called twisting. Instead of the feature being circular, it ends up being oval. Now, it's amazing that actual working memory has a lot of distortion in it. This is an SEM of some Samsung memory that was just taken from a commercial product. Each one of these vias ought to be circular, ideally, but they're not. So the designs are, have been made to be tolerant to these distortions. So here's an example of how this random variation and charging of features leads to distortions. On the left are a sequence of four vias in which we remove charging from the model. And on the right is where we include charging in the model. The electric fields that are produced between each one of these features can deviate the trajectory of a positive ion that lead to this twisting phenomenon. So here is an example how even when you have a symmetric profile, you have equal spacing between these vias that just a statistical variation in the species coming into each one of those holes can lead to feature to feature variation in how the feature terminates. These little squares here are the center of the via as it hits the bottom of the feature. And there's a bit of a randomness due to the random charging from feature to feature. Now, if you have a pattern in which there are more features on one side than the other side, you have more charging on the right side than the left side that creates larger electric fields that push ions to the left than the feature on the left pushing ions to the right. And that produces a distortion in where the features land that are slanted towards the open area compared to the features that are in a symmetrical pattern. This is a tremendously important, in high important problem in high volume manufacturing. Another very important problem and challenge is simultaneously etching different materials. Uh, this is what's known as an ONO, oxide nitride oxide stack. It is the fundamental starting point for high capacity memory. The way that you make this very high capacity memory is to have now up to 512 alternating layers of oxide and nitride. You etch a hole through these 512 layers and then each one of these individual intersections eventually becomes a, a bit of memory. Now, oxide and nitride being both dielectrics etched by the same fundamental process. And that is you deposit a thin polymer layer, you form a feature, you form a intermediate complex, you activate that complex for the etch. But because the kinetics of oxides and nitrides are a little bit different, you have different layers of polymer and different etch rates between the oxide and the nitride. And that leads to some challenges in high aspect ratio etching of these ONO stacks. So this is the simulation of etching a, an 80 layer ONO stack through silicon nitride that's 30 nanometers per layer and silicon dioxide that's 20 nanometers per layer. The goal is to have a very, very straight sidewall and a similar topology 
on both the silicon layers and on the nitride layers. And sometimes you're able to achieve that, sometimes you're not able to achieve that. So you go through a very parametric study of, for example, how might you remove the polymer inside the feature in order to affect the sidewall slope. And this is an example of allowing oxygen to etch some of the polymer inside the feature to make the etch rates of the oxide and the nitride more equal. And that leads to the ability of controlling the sidewall slope of these very high aspect ratio features. Atomic layer etching. I think I've hopefully been able to convince you that if you get to be a small enough feature, you're always dealing with statistics. That you have a small enough feature, the number of ions that go into one feature are different than the number of ions going into another feature just by square root of n over n statistics. So if you want to get monolayer control, that the controlling of removing or adding a single ad layer of atoms at a time, and you're dealing with statistics, you're probably never going to get there. So you need to defeat statistics by using what are known as self-limiting processes. Processes that will naturally turn themselves off before statistics dominate. And this is the source of a process known as atomic layer etching. In atomic layer etching, you start with, for example, a silicon surface. You generate a flux of chlorine atoms that passivates that surface. When the surface is fully passivated, the passivation stops, stealth limiting. You then come in with a very, very carefully crafted distribution of, ion, of argon ions that have enough energy to remove the passivation, but not the underlying silicon. When you remove the passivated silicon, it naturally stops, self-limited. So by alternating fluxes of radicals and ions, radicals and ions, you can remove a single layer of atoms at a time in a sequential process. Two self-limited processes in sequence removed a single layer of atoms. And this is the basis of nanometer engineering of semiconductor devices. So we spent quite a while looking at some of the physics of atomic layer etching. The way that we do that is start with the reactor fit, the reactor scale. On the left is a simulation of a chlorine plasma producing chlorine atoms that would come down onto a wafer. On the right side is a simulation of an argon plasma that would provide the chemical sputtering ions. We alternate between the chlorine and the argon, and we predict then the evolution of the semiconductor features. This is a simulation of a thin FET transistor in which we alternate between passivation and chemical sputtering to produce extremely straight sidewalls and if the animation gets to the end here, look at the corners uh, of the fin of these two fins. You want to clear out and have very, very, very sharp corners in order to maintain reproducibility. And this is something that is the state of the art in manufacturing processes is implementing these atomic layer processes. Implementing atomic layer processes for dielectric etch is a little bit more tricky. And that's because it's intrinsically not self-terminating. Uh, you may recall that the dielectric etch proceeds by depositing a very thin layer of polymer. The thickness of the polymer layer determines how much etch can occur. And that thickness is not something that's self-terminated. So depositing exactly the amount of polymer you need and having exactly the amount of ion flux you need 
to remove this dielectric layer by layer is a state-of-the-art problem. So here again is some simulations. This is the gas phase uh, simulation of an argon C4F8 plasma that provides a flux of fluorocarbon radicals that deposits the polymer layer. You follow it up with an argon plasma that produces energetic ions to chemically sputter that layer. And this is the end result. Every half layer, every half cycle, you deposit precisely the, uh, the proper thickness of polymer. That polymer builds up and then is removed as it chemically reacts with the underlying silicon dioxide to remove a prescribed amount of silicon dioxide per cycle. Now, if you're not really good at this and you deposit just a little bit too much polymer every cycle, then you get to some point where the etch process transitions into deposition. By having that tiny little bit of polymer left over every cycle, you eventually go from ions being able to penetrate through the polymer to ions not being able to penetrate through the polymer, and that leads to deposition. Well, this becomes an even more challenging problem when you're trying to etch, instead of flat surfaces, features such as short trenches. So here is an example of a simulation of a very short trench, only 20 by 40 nanometers. This is used in developing photoresist masks. And if you, don't, if you have just a little bit too much polymer per layer, the feature will eventually fill with polymer before you're able to clear the feature. So from the left to the right is, uh, from the left to the right is the uh, increasing, excuse me, decreasing the amount of polymer that's being deposited. You get a little bit of etching and then the feature fills up with polymer and on the right side is the ideal atomic layer etching. So let's look forward a little bit. And part of that looking forward is realizing that this is a system. It's not just a bunch of components, but it is a system in which every aspect of the components talk to each other. And I'd like to use as an example how it's very easy to have uncontrolled ions hitting your wafer. So what I have here is a schematic of what's known as an inductively coupled plasma. For those of you who have taken Professor Samani's Introduction to Electromagnetics courses, you know that if you pass antenna, if you pass AC current through a wire, you will generate magnetic fields that go around the wire that uh, magnetic field then produces a, an alternating electric field. This is called inductive coupling. This inductive electric field is what produces the plasma. But if those of you who have taken circuit classes know that there is a voltage drop across an inductor. And this antenna is, for all practical purposes, an inductor you have a VLDIDT voltage drop across that antenna. And that voltage on the antenna is seen by the plasma. That's called capacitive coupling. When you turn on a plasma during pulse processing, this capacitive coupling produces a very high positive potential in the plasma. That positive potential then delivers energetic ions to the wafer in a very uncontrolled way. So you're worried about RF engineering of the antenna to get the, properly, uh, the proper electric fields to produce the plasma, but at the same time, there is coupling between the antenna and the substrate that delivers energetic ions to the substrate a truly coupled system.
So here is that inductively coupled plasma. There is the antenna. We are, for, we are applying a pulse of plasma, excuse me, a pulse of power. Uh, you have inductive coupling from the antenna. You have capacitive coupling due to this voltage on the antenna that reaches all the way down to the wafer. Uh, this is the electron density, power deposition, ion density, and capacitive power that is produced as you turn on the, pla the power and turn off the power. The inductive coupling is very well behaved. The capacitive coupling produces waves in the plasma that rattle around and produce higher harmonics, which are not a good thing. And at the end of the day, this is what happens. You have energetic ions that strike both the dielectric window under the antenna, but more importantly, energetic ions that are striking the wafer. And these are ions that are sort of undesigned. They're never part of a process. They just happen because you have coupling between the top of the reactor and the bottom of the reactor. It's a system. There is no isolated component. It's just a system. So I'd like to make some just final comments about something that is on everybody's mind, and that is machine learning. I mean, it, it's difficult to find a discipline that's not looking for ways to apply machine learning. Applications of machine learning are at the forefront of process divine for advanced microelectronics fabrication and control. The goal is to reduce the amount of experimenting that you need to do, reduce the number of wafers that you process to develop a new process. However, it's extremely expensive to run hundreds or thousands of wafers to produce the data training set. So what you learn from one training set must transfer to another set of conditions Otherwise, you have to develop the training set again. And if you have to develop the training set for every application in the machine learning, why do the machine learning? You already have the data. So what you need to do is to develop a machine learning technique that will produce parameters that will, can be applied to other conditions. And that allows you to leverage the huge investment that you've made in developing the training set to other conditions. Machine learning has been very successful in, for example, control of plasma processes, been very successful in determining where in manufacturing processes there are bad steps. But Machine learning has been not very successful in process design. How do you pick the conditions to etch a particular feature having a particular sidewall slope or a particular chemical composition? So the approach that we're taking in our group is to use machine learning to extract from experimental data fundamental parameters, fundamental physics and chemical parameters like reaction probabilities and cross-sections and scattering rates. And those fundamental physics-based parameters should extend to other processes because it's just physics. And the physics doesn't change. So this is some work that we are doing in real time. And I have just one preliminary result to share with you, but has some very, very promising results. The way we do this is to use our reactor scale model to develop reactive fluxes that go into the feature scale model. That feature scale model predicts a profile. We compare that to an experimental profile. And we match the profile by adjusting the fundamental physics parameters in our algorithms. When we get a match, we should then have some better estimate for these basic physics parameters 
that would be used in other processes. So to do that, we have simplified our mechanism to be seven individual steps, each one that has a parametric form. We do our best to simulate the type of reactor that's used to develop the training set. And here's an example of that process. On the right is the scanning electron microscope image of a high aspect ratio feature that we're trying to derive the fundamental physics parameters responsible for the feature. And on the left is a sequence of feature scale simulations in this optimization process, trying different parameters to fit the feature. And the end result is that we are able to meet metrics of depth and width we don't quite get the sidewall slope, but then again, that wasn't one of our metrics. And this is the direction that I believe that machine learning and process design could take. Use machine learning to derive from the experimental data the basic physics parameters that are required in models that should be applicable to other conditions. So with that, I'd like to conclude by saying modeling of reactor and feature scale process for plasma processing are providing insights to basic processes. They're speeding up process development. And it's really a competitive advantage to companies that are committed to simulation of reactor processes and feature evolution. Without naming names, there are certain semiconductor companies that have embraced modeling and simulation and there are those who are not, who have not. Those who have not are now making a commitment to modeling and simulation. So those of you looking for jobs, think about maybe modeling and simulation as a way to, uh, to pursue your career. What are the challenges? Well, there are extremely diversity of different types of reactors and processes. Uh, that said, there are many commercial and university software platforms that are available and widely used. The challenges moving forward are, I hate to say these words in front of an electrical engineering audience, but I have to say them, chemistry. That in large part the challenge is to get the proper reactive species in the right place at the right time to, re to react with the semiconductor materials to make the features you want if there's a lot of chemistry in there. Finally, perhaps the role of machine learning is to help to develop those mechanisms so that the processes can be extended to a wider range of conditions. With that, I thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions you might have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. That was a Really interesting one, mm -hmm. specifically at this time that you're hearing a lot again about semiconductor mm -hmm. fabrication mm -hmm. voice in the States and specifically in Ohio for yeah. this new investment of right. you know, Intel here in the States. Mm -hmm. So I believe that was a good coincidence that we had you mm -hmm. today for this yeah. seminar. But questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, p please project your sound because we don't have the second mic. Mm -hmm. uh, this being said, that caused uh, hundreds of processes to reach fabrication. May I know your academic opinion on the current role of plasma enabled technology in semiconductor based computing industry, to be specific for aging holes and deposition states? Oh, excuse me, the, the last, last one was specifically for? Uh, for aging holes and deposition states. Uh, in mm. addition, uh, the immediate necessity of research for better plasma processing uh, capability in academia. Uh, for example, in 3D NAND structure currently has 32 layers of memory cell compared to an estimated up to 500 layers in the future. Yeah. So the, you know, the need for necessity for better pro plasma processing capability in academia yeah. right now, the immediate yeah. necessity. Thank you. So let me interpret that, that question um, maybe a little bit generously. Uh, what is the role of academics in, in everything that I've said here? Uh, in, in fact, we had a uh, conversation at lunch on this very topic. 
Now, this is an industrial process, and there is intellectual property and secrets that industry have that sometimes makes it difficult to have interactions and collaborations. Uh, the Intel fabrication facility that's going in, which way is east? Uh, a couple of hours that way, is $20 billion. No university is able to invest that level of money into the plasma tools and the, the lithography tools and all the other tools to be able to produce the state-of-the-art features that would be required for a day-to-day -day collaboration with the industry. So the role of academics is to provide capability for industry to solve their own problems. Now, we do modeling. Modeling is much easier to do this. We develop codes that have capability. We use them to do these types of investigations. We give the codes to the companies. The company use the codes in their own proprietary way to solve their own problems. Create capability that enhances the capabilities of, uh, of industry. So in the non-modeling non areas, it would be developing new materials that have specific electrical properties that can be used in these advanced devices. It's developing machine learning algorithms that don't have to be developed on proprietary features. They need to be capable of doing that, transfer that capability to industry. Uh, it's developing new ways to match radio frequency power to nonlinear loads. It doesn't have to be exactly the load that industry has, but you provide that capability to industry. So I think the, the secret is to come to some middle ground where the problems that you're working on are relevant to industry, but you don't get into what we call the critical path. You don't want to be on that, sitting on the train tracks when that freight train comes by because you might get squished. But the capability you're developing is relevant and can be inserted into their critical path. So a little bit hidden in this, in this particular plot was um, we apply power to actually a power supply that goes through a matching network. That matching network applies power to the antenna. And in this plot, the total power here is what's coming out of the power supply. This is the power that comes in through one mode, it's called inductive. This is the other power that comes in through capacitive. And this green line is the reflected power. The reflected power results from a mismatch between the impedance of this entire reactor and the matching network in the power supply. Now, a problem here, a very, very big problem is that this is 30 microseconds worth of pulse. The matching components that you have in a high power matching network are capacitors and they're inductors. And the way that you change that capacitance and inductance is to physically go over to a knob and turn those capacitors. That cannot be changed in 30 microseconds. Yet the impedance of this plasma is changing by orders of magnitude when you pulse the plasma. In fact, it goes from inductive to capacitive. It goes, uh, excuse me, it goes from capacitive to inductive. It goes from a negative 
reactants to a positive reactance. It goes from a resistance of maybe 5 or 10 kilo ohms down to 5 or 10 ohms. How do you match that with no reflected power when you don't have the capability to change the physical capacitance of the components in the matchbox anywhere that fast? So this is a state-of-the-art problem that has real consequences that if you're reflecting the power, it's not going into the plasma. Where does that reflected power go? You hope it doesn't go back into your power supply. Power supply has got to be bigger. You have more nonlinearities. You have more pulse-to-pulse -pulse variation. So simply getting the power into the plasma as an RF engineering issue is right at the top of reactor design. So how do you do that? One of the, the techniques that are being used is frequency tuning. You can change the frequency that goes into the matchbox or coming out of the power supply much, much faster than you can change anything else. You can sweep megahertz per microsecond. So is there a way that you can design the RF power delivery so that you can adjust the impedance matching by varying frequency or throwing in a harmonic so that you can match 100% without reflected power during these extreme transients in plaza properties? That's a very, very high value problem in in RF engineering, microwave engineering, and plasma engineering. Are there questions? Why is it that we specifically use RF and not microwave? Oh, excuse me? Oh, excuse me? Uh, why does the frequency have to be in uh, megahertz and not megahertz? Oh. Uh, let's see, do we have another three or four hours? No. Um, well, one of the reasons why you use RF is the fact that the wafer here that you're applying power to is a dielectric. Again, I'm sorry, solid state people. Silicon is not a conductor. It's a dielectric. And you don't want that wafer to charge up to a high voltage because it can damage the devices in the wafer. So you sort of do the back of the envelope calculation and to have capacitive current going through the wafer it sort of needs to be at least a few megahertz to prevent charge up. So that, that's one issue. Another issue is uh, that if you're using inductive coupling, uh, that antenna is an inductor. It's just a solenoid of some sort. You've got a VLDIDT and just the voltage drop and the impedance of that antenna is just too high if you get to too high of a frequency. But a large portion of the choice of frequencies is really based on, really based on the plasma physics. That there is a certain frequency dependence that the heating rate of electrons have. And there is a frequency dependence to how you shape the ion energy distribution. You can vary that ion energy distribution by frequency. So for better or worse, the choice of many of these frequencies was first made on the basis of these physics issues. And then once those, those decisions were made, then the engineering came in and said, how do I match this? I mean, how do I get this power in? How do I, how do I uh, not have reflected power? So this goes back to my comment about the need for a systems perspective. That unless you are approaching these types of problems with a systems perspective, it's just almost unsolvable. In the old days when feature sizes were a micron, well, it was OK. Fabs only cost $500,000 in those days. Now fabs cost $20 billion. I mean, maybe you'd want to take a more assistant perspective. 
Any other questions? I just have one maybe for the last question. So definitely it's a system should work yeah. together and it's an expensive system. But if we want to be focused on just the plasma source, okay, so what do you see the upcoming challenges and, and the future of those sources? Uh, and perhaps unsaid, but needs to be said is this is a circular, circular wafer, it's a, it's a disc, and the area of the wafer goes like radius, RDR. Each chip has a, a finite area to it. So you are able to put more chips on the edge of the wafer than in the center of the wafer. Which means that if the plasma is not uniform all the way to the edge of the wafer, you are producing defective devices on the edge of the wafer where most of your chips lie because that's where most of the, most, most of the area is. This leads to a problem that's called edge exclusion. That there's some number of millimeters, and I hope it's no more than a few millimeters at the edge of the wafer, that produces non-functioning chips. So as you try to optimize the plasma to produce the chemical reactivity and the ion energy distributions that you need, also maintaining uniformity in those fluxes all the way to the edge of the wafer within about half a percent is of paramount importance. The physics will say higher frequency is better. And you would be motivated to use microwaves. 2.45 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz would be even better. The problem is that the wavelength at 20 gigahertz is getting pretty short. And when the wavelength goes into a plasma, it gets even shorter. And if you have an effective wavelength that's only a quarter the size of the wafer, then you have all sorts of possibilities for generating a non-uniform plasma that uh, produces non-functioning chips at the edge. So I would say the state of the art in, in source design is how can you use the higher frequencies that are intrinsically better for the physics but maintain the uniformity? Thank you. So if there is no other questions, let's thank our speakers one again. Thank you very much. Oh, you're